I've been heard, heard many stories since I've been here, and wonderful stories and great stories. And uh, I think all of these stories are like, you know, they're all like roses in a garland around Baba because they're really all about Baba and about what Baba, Baba's, um, Baba's love for all of us and Baba's care in bringing each of us to him, uh, each in a way that really suits each of our makeup and each of our, uh, our needs um, that will allow us to really come to him. So uh, I share this in the spirit of just adding one more rose to the garland. Uh, I want to start with a quote that I find really have, has been a very inspiring quote to me. And hopefully by the end, um, it'll be maybe uh, more evident why I chose this quote. Uh, it's a quote of Baba's. The truth of one's own perception and realization is the only road by which wholeness may be restored to the inner psychic being. In no other way can man obtain release from the chains that tie the limited ego mind to the colossal cosmic illusion which hides from him the perennial spring of the divinity within. Jay Baba. So uh, I'm going to tell the story of how I came to Baba, and I'm going to share some reflections at the end of it. Um, and then I'll transition more briefly to talk about um, the, the establishment of a Mayor Baba group in Washington, D.C. And I was born in Washington, D.C., um, and my family was a very uh, Jewish intellectual family. My father an atomic physicist, my mother a psychiatric social worker, um, I had a brother and a sister, and um, my family was essentially, my father I would describe as agnostic, leaning toward the atheistic side, but probably you know, at least as a, as a fair intellectual, you know, with fair intellectual honesty, he sort of would hold open the possibility of God. Uh, my mother was very anti-God. I think she thought religion is, has been the root of all, of most evil in, in civilization, which I don't fully disagree with um, in many ways. Um, but that's, that was her attitude. So that was the atmosphere. And even though we were Jewish, I can, I can hardly remember going to a synagogue or a shul in my life. Um, we would do Passover, but it was always a cultural affair. It was never really a, um, a religious affair. It had no religious meaning. Uh, around the age of about 11 or 12 or something like that, um, I did have a friend who, uh, who was also Jewish who was taking Hebrew lessons. And for some reason, I was interested in sort of taking Hebrew lessons with him. So I got permission from my parents and um, uh, went and studied. I think there were two or, only two or three of us studying with this rabbi, an old man with a dark suit and a long beard and a hat and you know the kind of stuff you associate with serious rabbis or orthodox rabbis. And what I found in the Hebrew lessons was it was essentially an exercise in translating shapes into sounds. And by that I mean to say is we were, we were looking at Hebrew script and learning kind of how to pronounce it. But there was no translation of anything. There was no meaning associated with it. It, was, it really was converting shapes into sounds. And it was very odd because at the, you know, after doing it for a while, um, he actually met with, uh, the rabbi met with my mother, I don't know why he, my mother even agreed to do it, and he said, you know, your son should be a Hebrew scholar. And I have to say, I don't know that anything would have turned me away from religion faster than that. <laughs> like, if that's what religion is, you know, I have no, um, I have no interest in it. But at any rate, uh, when I got to, to high school age, my parents sent me to a Quaker school, and it was... It was a Quaker school. Um, it was a very wonderful Quaker school. It was a very small school. Um, it was founded by a birthright Quaker named Brooke Moore, who was a very sincere and a very deep, spiritually deep man. And he was really interested in having a school that taught genuinely Quaker values. And it was, there were only like 90 or 100 kids in the school when I was there. Uh, we'd start every day with a 20 minute meeting of worship, silent meeting of worship. Um, and I think we all came to, you know, I think people came to love that 20 minutes of silence. Um, and I got my first real taste of metaphysical reality 
from Brooke Moore because when we were seniors, we were all invited in small groups uh, to, to have dinner with he and his wife um, at their home. He had built his, it was a hand-built house in the country and we'd go there. And somehow somebody seemed to know a little bit about Brooke that I didn't know. And they asked him about his experiences with a woman named Jean Dixon. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of her. She's a very well-known psychic, probably at the time one of the best known psychics in, in, the, in uh, America, wrote many books, and he was friends with her. And so he described a couple of seances he went to with her. And that was the first time I'd ever heard, you know, heard anybody who I respected talk seriously about anything about non-physical reality. And so I was just completely taken, taken aback by it. And I remember driving home in the country road that night uh, just like a little freaked out that, uh, you know, uh, with, you know, all of a sudden ghosts were real. And that was like very strange to me. But that was my first real exposure uh, to that. So my high school, my life in high school had its own challenges. Um, my parents got divorced while I was in high school, and that was very upsetting to me. And then I lived with my mother, and she, my, my brother had left uh, and had, was traveling out in California. Um, becoming a hippie. And so I was left at home with my mother. And we, um, my mother was concerned about me and my well-being. And so she brought in a boarder, a fairly wonderful man, young, young man, who was in college at the time, named Stuart Champion. And, and she wanted him there as kind of a surrogate brother for me. And uh, Stuart and I bonded very deeply, very fast. And, um, and then within two months, he was involved in a car accident and killed. And so I was coping with, you know, that on top of the divorce. And it was a very difficult time. It must have been about 1966, around that time. Uh, so in the midst of all of that, my brother, who had been in California, he'd been, he'd been at, in the Haight-Ashbury area. And those, I assume many of you know what that is, but that was the epicenter of the hippie movement. Uh, in the 1960s, and he had become a hippie, and he'd come back, and he wanted to uh, expose me to LSD. And so uh, he guided me on, my, on an LSD trip. And it, it, was a, it was a major turning point, that trip. It was a very, it's not that I'm recommending it to anybody in here, and I, you know, Baba certainly has his own admonitions, though there's a great deal to be said about that, actually, which I won't get into, but um, it's a more, it's a much more complex subject um, um, but uh, I had an extraordinary experience with the LSD, and it really did transform me into, uh, it, it put me into a state of awareness and consciousness that was extremely open and loving and um, uh, expansive. And it exposed me to the reality that there, was, there were states of consciousness way beyond normal human consciousness that were really quite wonderful and quite worthy of aspiring towards. And the experience of that stayed with me for a long time, for months after that. Um, so that was, that was my first exposure to um, higher consciousness uh, in that way. Um, and Baba did say that um, for a few sincere seekers, uh, LSD actually does open up, open up to the possibility of spiritual reality and can be very useful for it being an entryway into the spiritual life. And I do think that that was, you know, I, I do think that was true for me. So at any rate, I completed, I completed high school. Uh, I was not very motivated in high school. I sort of, you know, and I was, I was also using other kinds of psychedelics and so on recreationally. And so I managed to get through high school, but I didn't have much sense about what I wanted to do. I went to Boston, where I spent a year in college at Boston University without any sense of direction at all. Uh, I think I skipped most of my classes. I did manage to end up with a B or B minus average somehow. I think it's through, through the use of those little cliff, cliff note guides. I think that was what got me kind of through college. But anyway, but after a year, I decided to drop out because I had no purpose in being there. And so that was the middle of the Vietnam War. That was now 1968 and, or 69 at that point. And uh, uh, young men in America, and I gather maybe here in elsewhere uh, had to face the issue of the draft. And because I'd been in, in, in Quaker school, I was able to make the case for a conscientious objector um, status. And um, I got it. I was awarded that. 
um, which was not so easy to get actually at the time, but I, you know, uh, somehow Baba must have made that possible because I was able to evade the draft, and I got, but I had to do two years of what's called alternative service, and so I got a job at Mass General Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, which is the major medical center associated with Harvard Harvard Medical School, uh, working for this uh, a guy named Keith Connors who was probably at the time and still today the top researcher in the area of what at the time was called childhood hyperactivity and uh, is now called ADHD. Um, and uh, I got a job as a research assistant with him and I spent two years doing that and living in the Cambridge, Boston area. And during that time uh, I was continuing to on my off when I wasn't working, continuing to you know do my sort of recreational stuff. And then a friend of mine was exposed to transcendental meditation, and he um, talked to me about it, and I thought, well, this sounds like a really great thing to do. This sounds a whole lot better than just getting stoned and doing that, you know, living that kind of life. So I gave up drugs, and I got myself initiated into TM, and I found with it fairly soon that it was a doorway into starting to explore other states of consciousness. And so it was very intriguing to me. But in the TM movement, at least the way I was experiencing it then in Cambridge, there wasn't much um, cosmology around it. It was really just a technique. Um, it was sold as for stress management or creativity or something like that, but it wasn't really sold as a spiritual technique. But I was interested in what the spiritual implications were, so I started to do exploring. I started to do reading, taking workshops, looking at Zen Buddhism. I read Autobiography of Yogi, like that. Um, one of the things I did at the time that was very significant for me was there was a man who at the time was named Baba Ramdas and who's now named Ramdas. Many of you may know him. Um, and he was formerly uh, Richard Alpert. He was a professor at Harvard University um, in league with uh, Timothy Leary and Alan Cohen, who's uh, in Sufism reoriented now. And they had done a tremendous amount of work exploring psychedelia. And uh, Baba Ramdas, though, had gone to India and had become a disciple of a, of a master there. And he was just back from one of his trips to India, and he was giving a talk about it in Boston at the Arlington Street Church. And I went to this, hear his talk. And it was a really extraordinary talk for me at the time. And I think like many, many, many other people in that group, and it was a fairly large group, uh, we, I was totally taken with his master. And, um, I would have, you know, had the urge to meet his master and to, to um, go to him, but he was. But Ramdas was not revealing the name of his master. He called him Maharaji, but that's not really his name, and he wouldn't reveal any details about where he was located. So there was no way to find him. But I think it was very widespread um, what that uh, what he was talking about. And in fact, just parenthetically, later on, Ramdas wrote a book about. On uh, uh, all of that, they called Be Here Now, which sold two million copies, and is kind of I think one of the major books that was uh, has influenced at least my generation and maybe generation other generations about um, spirituality. Um, but at any rate, I was very taken with that talk, so I knew that he was a very special man, this Maharaji. Then somewhere after that, a friend of mine from school uh, exposed me to Meribaba. Uh, no one had talked about Mary Baba when I was in high school. Uh, it has turned out, by the way, that uh, of my class of 100 people, I think seven of us became Baba lovers, all independently and out beyond that. So I think we probably have a pretty high percentage of <laughs> graduates from that school. Um, and, but this one friend of mine, she's the daughter of a guy named David McClelland. Any of you who are psychologists might recognize the name. Um, uh, a well-known motivational psychologist, his daughter Sarah gave me a copy of a little booklet called The Moving Finger Rights Volume 2, which is just a little pithy little volume of uh, discourses by Baba. And she told me that Baba said he was the avatar. And something struck me about that, like there was something significant about Baba. So after that, he was, he was in my mind, and then I heard that there was going to be a talk given at Lowell Hall at Harvard University by Alan Cohen called Drugs, Consciousness, and Avatar Mayor Baba. And so I decided to go to this talk. And I went and listened to him. And 
It was a lovely talk, but I couldn't figure out any method. And I was at that time, meditation, yoga, so on. I was looking for a method, and I couldn't figure out a method. So it was lovely. They showed a beautiful film of Bob and Myrtle Beach, looked nice. Um, one thing I do recall about it is that, that uh, they gave out a little don't worry, be happy card. And Alan said that Baba had said that anyone who remembered Baba's name at the time of breathing their last would come to him. And I thought, well, that's worth doing. So I put the photo on my wall and I made a point of making sure I said Baba's name at least once a day. So that was my initial contact with Baba. I did have another friend from high school who had lived with me for a while in Cambridge. We were both sort of seeking spiritually and then he'd gone back to Washington. And he had become very interested in Ramakrishna, who he thought was the avatar, because Ramakrishna said things like that. Um, and so, uh, so, so uh, I called Steve, his name was Steve, I called him up one day and I, in our conversation I said, do you know who Mayor Baba is? And he said, no. And I said, well, he, who is he? And I said, well, he says he's the avatar. And so that, that was that. So um, I finished in 1971. I completed my alternative service. I only had to do two years of it. Uh, I had a girlfriend in England at the time. Oh, oh no, before that. So another man, while I was in Boston, uh, I was in a food co-op. And one of the people in the food co-op gave me a copy of the discourses. And I read the discourses, and I thought, for the first time, I felt like I was reading something written by somebody who actually knew what he was talking about. That he was talking from a place of already being there and talking to those of us that are on our way there. Whereas everybody else, by contrast, felt like they were feeling their way in the dark. And, and this felt like, this didn't feel that at all. This felt like this is, the author it was authoritative. And so I was very taken with it, and I was very drawn to it. I didn't particularly attracted to what he said about um, his prohibitions about sex outside marriage. Uh, I did have a girlfriend at the time and I wasn't quite ready to give that up. So I sort of set it aside, but I thought of Bob as being very significant. So I finished my alternative service and decided I didn't have anything going on. My girlfriend at the time had gone to a school in, uh, in England called Emerson College. It's a uh, Rudolf Steiner school. Rudolf Steiner is uh, the founder of Anthroposophy. And uh, so I figured I'd go there and be with her and then I'd travel around Europe and kind of sort out my life because I, I wasn't in school, I had no profession, you know, I had some money saved up, you know, I was, I was free. So to do that, uh, I packed everything up in Boston and I put it in my car and I drove it to Washington where my parents lived to leave my car off so I could fly off. And I got to Washington and I called my friend Steve. And Steve, uh, Steve was at the time planning his first trip to Myrtle Beach. Was, this was January 1972. And he wanted me to come with him. And Steve was a very good friend. And so I said, oh, I'll go with you as long as we don't go for too long. Because I wanted to get on with my trip. So we drove down to Myrtle Beach. He didn't know anything about Myrtle Beach. To the, to the point that he didn't even know you could stay on the center. So we, the first night, we camped out in the campground in the middle of January. Um, it's quite cold. And then we got on the center the next day, and then that's when they told us we could stay there. So we decamped and moved to the center. So I found the center um, a beautiful place. Um, I liked the feeling there, but I found the people a little odd. <laughs> and they were odd in, in a particular way. I found odd, what was odd about them was they all seemed to have a personal relationship with Mayor Baba that I couldn't figure out what the basis of it was. So. I sort of kept my distance a little bit. But everybody who visited the center was um, invited to meet with Kitty Davy at the time. Kitty Davy I, has been talked about here. Um, if I assume you all, I assume folks here know who she was. She was Mayor Baba's, one of her very first um, Western disciples. Mayor Baba spent his first night in the West, actually had her parents' home in England. Um, and in 19, she lived with Baba from 1937 to 1952 in India. Uh, and then on the, Baba's first trip to, uh, to the center, uh, he brought Kitty with him. And on the last day of his trip, uh, as, they were, as they were all getting ready to leave, including Kitty, Baba turned to Kitty and said, would you mind staying here and helping Elizabeth? And just on the spur of the moment, she said yes. And she spent the rest of her life there uh, until she died uh, in 1990. 
1991. At any rate, at, the time, at this time she was about 80 years old, and she would meet all the new people. And so we went over to meet Kitty, Steve and I. And she had a beautiful little office there in, the, in, what, is now the, in what was Elizabeth's home called Dilruba. And um, we were there for an interview. And as far as I was concerned, this was Steve's interview. I mean, I was just a hanger on. I was just, you know, accompanying my friend. So we're sitting there and Kitty's, you know, says, Kitty's the most natural person in the world. You know, she's a completely normal looking person. There's nothing, you know, like so many of Baba's close ones, there's nothing that stands out unless you tune into kind of who they are. But, um, but I wasn't that attuned. So to me, it was, she was just a nice old lady. And uh, she says, you know, she says to me, she turns to me, she says, so tell me about yourself. What are you doing? And I said, I'm, um, you know, getting ready to go to Europe and, um, you know, travel around Europe. And she looks at me with kind of very intently and she says, I think you're looking for something. And I thought, who is this old lady peering into my mind? <laughs> so I, you know, it's a backed off a little bit. So we go on with the conversation and she's asking Steve what he's doing. You know, it's, it's just a, it's a very normal conversation. It's not a, an interrogation. It's not even an interview. It's just a conversation. And then she, all of a sudden she turns to me and she looks very directly at me and she says, I think you're looking for something. And I think if you go to Rishikesh in India, you'll find what you're looking for. <laughs> now, I didn't know much, but I knew a little bit. And I knew that Rishikesh was not where the major Baba headquarters was. I, you know, I knew that it, Rishikesh is, is one of the great uh, pilgrimage sites in India. It's where the Ganges comes out of the Himalayas, and it's, there are a lot of ashrams, and there's sadhus, and you know, meditating in caves. And that's what, you know, now, now Rishikesh is a supermarket of yoga and you know, crystals and stuff like that. But back then, that's what it was. And Baba visited there a number of times. That's where Shivananda's ashram was and so on. So I knew that she wasn't just passing me off to the next higher authority of Baba to try to seduce me to become a Baba lover. I knew that much. And so I thought, that's interesting. But I said to Kitty, well, I, I think I'm going to go to Europe anyway. And she said, well, if you go to Europe, make sure you go to the spiritual places that Baba told us about. And she told me what they were. There are four spiritual places in Europe that Baba talked about. St. Mark's uh, in Venice. Um, Assisi, uh, Villa, and uh, somewhere on the Ligurian coast, I think is the fourth one. And then she said, and uh, if you're in England, you can look up my family. And she gave me contact information for her family members. And that was the end. And we walked out. And I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. So we finished our time at the center, and I was driving back to Washington with my friend Steve. And, all of us, and I was just thinking about the events of the center, and all of a sudden, it hit me like a thunderbolt that Kitty was right, that I should do exactly what she said and go to Rishikesh. It was like, it was the, probably the deepest intuition that I've ever had in my life. In fact, I'm sure it was. And so I turned to Steve and I said, Steve, I'm going to Rishikesh. And sure enough, the next week I got on a plane and I flew to England and spent a few weeks with my girlfriend. And at the end of which we decided to part ways because she was on the anthroposophy track and I was not. You know, I was going to go to India and find what I was looking for. And I should say, my plan was to go overland to India. So um, how to get to India? Well, I went to the, uh, this book called The Last Whole Earth Catalog. Some of you may know it by Stuart Brand. And there was a half page article about how to make an overland trip to India. And I ripped that out. And that was my entire guide. <laughs> I never looked at a map. I had no idea. You know, other than go here, go here, go here, go here. And I followed it and I went overland by train to Istanbul. And then um, I found a group of Germans who had a bus and I at the one of the pudding shops and I joined them and we got a certain distance before their bus broke down. And then I hitchhiked and, you know, they, what was called the hippie trail. Some of you may have even, actually, you wouldn't take it from Australia, but people from, from that part of the world took that trail and you follow it and you go through Turkey and Iran and Afghanistan and at the time the border with Pakistan was closed so you had to kind of fly over the border. So uh, I got to India and I decided before going to Rishikesh since I might never leave there um, I should do a little traveling. So I went up to Kashmir for a little while to Srinagar 
And then I decided to, to trek in Nepal. So I went up to Nepal and I, uh, with, a part, with a friend I'd made on the way, uh, did a trek in an, in, uh, up to a place called Jomson. And Jomson is just south of the uh, Tibetan border. It's about uh, 75 miles in up and down mountains and 75 miles back. And it just been opened up to Westerners, very primitive. And um, so we were trekking up to Jomson and one day we're, we're just, and there's no, there's no commercial development, a few tea shops, that's it. There was no hotels, restaurants, nothing. You just knocked on, you just, you know, went up to somebody's door in a village and you knocked on the door and just with hand gestures, you sort of say, can you give me something to eat? That kind of thing. So, uh, so one day we're, we must have been waiting beside the trail and this guy comes up with long hair, sort of hippie-ish, um, looks kind of South American, you know, coloring. And he introduces himself as Carlos and we get to talking. And it turns out he has just come from being with, with um, Maharaji, um, Ram Dass's guru. And um, he told me who, what his name was, which is Neem Karoli Baba. And uh, he told me where to find him. And so I registered all that. I thought, but well, that's interesting. I kind of let me take note of that. So ev anyway, I eventually found my way to Rishikesh. Now at this time, my entire kind of mental model about spirituality was kind of, without realizing it, was sort of an ascetic model. It was sort of, you know, um, meditation, yoga, you know, whatever, all, everything that goes with that. That was sort of how I was assuming spirituality was. And when I was in Rishikesh, I, I, I spent a, you know, a couple weeks there wandering around trying to see, well, Kitty said I should come here. I'd find what I was looking for, but I didn't find anything. I didn't find anything that sort of attracted me or drew me in it, or even resonated as something that would sort of match who I was. And so I didn't, I couldn't figure out what, what I was doing there. And I started thinking, well, maybe she's, maybe this is all wrong. Maybe I should just go back and give it up and leave and, you know, you know, um, try something else. But I decided I had, before I was going to give up, I realized that the most important factor in a spiritual life I did, fortunately, I'd read enough to know was to have an actual spiritual master. And so I decided before I give up, I should try to find a master. And then I looked at this little slip of paper and it turned out my, Neem Karoli Baba was about you know, a day's journey from there. It was very close. You know, in Indian standards today, you know, four, a four or five hour bus drive is nothing. And so I said, let me go there. So I went, took a bus to Nanatal, and then took another bus down in, into a valley to a little, tiny little village called Kanchi, which is where his ashram was. And I entered the temple grounds, and I was taken to meet him. And um, he, oh, he was an old man wrapped up in a blanket. Many of you may have seen his photographs before. Uh, he was an old man wrapped up in a blanket, and uh, I met him. And it was nothing earth-shaking about it. It was, you know, you know, I bowed down, you know, paid, you know, had a starshan, paid my obeisance. Uh, he was in a little room at that time, and he said, "Okay, now enough, get out." And so I left. But there was a very small group of Westerners living there with with him at the time, and uh, living nearby. They didn't live in the temple, but they lived nearby. And I decided, you know, let me stay here for a while and find out what's here. And so I joined them. Uh, and became part of what they call the satsang, the, the community of people associated with them. And so I did that, and um, we, you know, joined them, and, and what that meant was every morning we'd get up very early and get a bus and go down to Kanchi and go to the temple at about six o'clock in the morning, and we'd sit in front of a little raised platform like this, and then he would come out and sit on the platform wrapped up in his blanket, and we would just sit around him, and uh, he would give darshan for a couple of hours and we'd just sit with them and hang out. And then after a couple of hours, we'd, he'd go back into his room, do whatever he did, and we'd just hang out and um, spend the rest of the day there just, you know, reading or doing whatever. And then in the afternoon, he'd come back out again and, and there'd be Darshan again, like that. And that became sort of the pattern of life. And I found that after being with him for a couple of days, I started having an inner, a an inner change from the experience of being with him. And it was an opening and an, an opening of awareness. And it grew and it grew and grew to the point that it was, 
that whatever I experienced on LSD, it was far beyond that. It was like doors opening to different layers of consciousness being with him. And it was a very extraordinary experience of love. But it never came, it was never a function of anything he said, because for one thing, he didn't speak English. And another thing, he didn't say much. And it wasn't a function of any practices. It wasn't like he was having, you know, there were no prescribed yoga, meditation, chanting, not, none of that. Um, it was all just being in the presence. And I came later to understand that this is called Guru Kripa, which means grace of the Guru. That's the, you know, if you had to call it a method, that's what you call it. It's being with the master is what that was. And so I was with him like that. Um, and it grew, the experience of being with him and the love of being with him grew to being very big and, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and just feeling enveloped in, in the experience of, of him like that. So that was my experience being with him. But the, but the other experience of being with him was I never felt that he was my guru. And everyone else there did from what I could see. I shouldn't say everyone else, but the people that were staying there, he gave them all Indian names, like Ram Das, he gave him that name, or Krishna Das, maybe a name that some of you know, a Kirtan singer, or Jai Uttal, or there, there are a bunch of them that, you know, that are fairly well known from that group. And I never, I never had the attraction to that, and I never felt it. It wasn't that I felt he wasn't my guru, it's just I never felt he was. And so I never could sort of find myself saying, well, give me a name like that. Not that that's how you would do it anyway. Um, and furthermore, after being there for a while, I started to feel like, I started to feel restless, like I couldn't stay there. And like, this is the fulfillment. This is beyond, the fulfillment it goes way beyond anything I ever dreamed of. Why would I want to leave here? But something in me was urging me to leave. So I didn't quite know what to make of that. But I started to get a few clues. And one of them was, one day, in the midst of all this, a number of us went into Delhi to do various, you know, errands that we had. And we decided we would meet at, um, for lunch in Connaught Place, Connaught Place, yeah. uh, in central, it's sort of in the center of New Delhi. And uh, it, we were gonna have lunch together at a Chinese restaurant. And I, on this particular day, uh, I sometimes wore a little baba button that my friend Steve had given me and, you know, just to wear it. And um, so I had it on that day. And I went to meet them at the Chinese restaurant and I walked, the Chinese restaurant was uh, off the lobby of a hotel. So I walked into the hotel, through the lobby, up a couple steps into the restaurant. And all of a sudden I heard this voice saying, J Baba. I don't know. And I turned like, what's that? And I turn around and there's this, there's very friendly looking guy coming at me. He said, my name's Jal Dostor. You know, <laughs> okay. And he was, he was in Delhi on a buying trip. He and James Cox were together and they were just checking out of the hotel when they saw me walk past. And he said, oh, the Baba button, I should find out who this guy is. So, so he came and he tracked me down. And so he said, you know, he said like, who are you? What are you doing? I told him what I was doing with Neem Karoli Baba. He said, you know, you might want to come down to Amanat or, you know, if you get some time, you really enjoy it, you meet Mayor Baba's disciples, all that. It was interesting. So, so that was an example of one thing that happened that started to f happen. Uh, that, that, that kind of experience happened several times while I was trying to decide what am I going to do if I leave Neem Karoli Baba? And so I started to feel like, well, if I'm going to go away from Neem Karoli Baba, for one thing, I'm only going to do it for a little while and then I'll come back. But where should I go? Well, maybe I should go to Amanagar. That It started to accrue to the point to which that seemed to be the obvious place to go because I couldn't figure out anywhere else I wanted to go. So I, I left Neem Karoli Baba uh, and uh, I, I took my leave. I got his blessing after some, it was after, I don't know, a month or something like that. And uh, I went down and made my way down uh, to Nagar. I stopped actually in Nasik for a 10-day uh, Vipassana Buddhist uh, meditation uh, course with a man named Goenka. And then, um, and then made my way uh, by bus to Nagar. And the bus dropped me off just opposite the trust office. And uh, so I walked over there. And uh, I can tell you the exact date. Um, it was July 12, 1972. And the reason I know that 
is because I, as I walked into the trust compound, there in the Sarosh Canteen was uh, Adi Kehrani and a number of folks who had just come back from the Duni. So, um, so I greeted them, they were very nice, and they showed me to my palatial uh, headquarters in the Dalat Hotel. And, uh, and, uh, and those of you who have not experienced the Dalat, it was not palatial. <laughs> Um, and then, I, and then, but I decided, I was, you know, I, I thought, well, let me hang out here for a couple of weeks. But I, I, I walked in there, I, I, went, I have to admit, with a bit of an attitude, because I'd just come from a living spiritual master, and here I was in a setting where there were, you know, Abba was dead. You know, as far as I could see, he was, he was buried. There were a lot of nice people, there were interesting stories, there were nice pictures, but it looked to me like kind of an oral tradition, frankly, at that time. And again, I had the same reaction to the Baba lovers, that they all seemed a little odd to me. Like, you know, Baba made me do this today, or Baba did this, to, you know, whatever, whatever sort of the personalization was that went with Baba, that was what I heard. And so I was, again, really quite put off by it. But I would go out and join them with, you know, going to Maribad. At the time, you couldn't stay there. So we would go out to Maribad for, I don't know if we made it for RTs, but we'd go there to visit, and then we'd go to Marizad. So I did this for a few days, kind of not knowing, again, why am I here? And finally one day, uh, it was a Marizad day, and at the time, uh, at that time we took state transport buses, these kind of orange buses uh, many of you have been on, um, out from Nagar, out to the approach road at Marizad, and we would take them out there and then they'd drop you off at the end of the approach road and you walk up the approach road um, half a mile or whatever it is. And so I was, on this particular day, I was walking up the approach road, just by myself, just thinking about stuff. And I was thinking, you know, um, why am I here? What am I doing in this place? And then I, and then I remembered something Erich had said in, the, in Mondeley Hall the day or two before, where Erich had said, that Baba had said, that having a love affair with him happened just opposite to how it happens in the world. He said that in the world, you meet somebody and you fall in love with them, and then you just can't stop thinking about them. But Baba said with him, it was just the opposite. You meet him, you start thinking about him, and then you fall in love with him. But you start by thinking about him. And I thought, I'm gonna be here for, you know, I've been sort of playing footsie with Baba really, for two years now. I'd known about him, I'd read him, I'd been to the center, I'd, you know, all this stuff. But I'd never really figured out how, do you, how to relate to Baba. I thought, well, maybe if I try thinking about it, I'm only gonna be here, I'm gonna just be here for two weeks. Let me just try as an experiment to think about him for two weeks and let's just see what happens. So I'm, I'm, st I'm just still just walking down the road. I mean, this is, who knows, you know, it could be minutes that take place. So I said, how do, how do you think about him? And I thought, well, the only thing I can think of is you say his name. It's the only thing I could grasp as a way of thinking about Baba. So I said, let me say his name. So I started to say Baba's name inwardly. The moment I took Baba's name the first time, it was like a floodgate opened. And Baba flooded me with the exact same inner experience that I'd had with Neem Karoli Baba. There was absolutely no difference in the quality, depth, and nature of the experience. It was, again, doors opening inside into this very beautiful inner states of love. And of love. It's the only way to describe it that I can describe. The only difference, and it was immediate, that I felt between what I'd experienced with the Nkuroli Baba was that I knew it had the clear imprint from Baba that I am your master. And that message was completely clear to me in that experience. So that, that is how I came to Baba. I mean, everything beyond that is, is you know, just, you know, uh, denouement. But I want to say a few things about that um, before I kind of transition to talking about um, uh, about about my experience in Washington, because I've done. Uh, I just wrote an. Uh, I just wrote this up for a book called "101 Names of Love," Volume Three, which I, I don't think you sell it in your bookstore, but it's a 
uh, Irma Shepard has been collecting stories from people from all over the world and publishing them. And so when I wrote it, I, I decided to add a few reflections onto it um, about kind of what, what I have taken out of that and what, what, what I feel is, has been significant about that experience I had of coming to Vava. Uh, one of them is, um, uh, it's very clear to me that the nature of, first of all, it's very clear to me that, uh, that even though Baba says in the discourses you need a living master, that's not true with Baba. Because I had the experience of a living master and I had the experience of Baba. And I know that Baba is as alive or more alive than, than a living master was to me. So I, I, I've had that visceral experience. I'm not saying that's true for anybody else, but I, you know, it's something that I came away from that really knowing. And I think I really needed to know that. Uh, I'm not saying other people have not necessarily needed to know that. I needed to know that inside myself because it resolved any future doubts in me about is this real and is this, you know, do I need something more than this? It really settled that question for me. Um, it also showed me uh, that the relationship with the master is clearly all about connections. And Baba said that, and we know that from Baba. But I would watch people come into the temple ground at, uh, with Neem Karoli Baba. And by the way, there's some extraordinary stories, you know, that Ram Dass tells about Neem Karoli Baba that are really um, very, very interesting. I'm not going to go into them here, but they're really interesting stories uh, about him um, and about who, who he really might be. But just to say that the nature of the connections, um, that people would go into that temple ground and they would walk in there and they'd fall on their knees in tears. But other people would walk in there and they'd say, huh? What's... And it wasn't necessarily that one was more spiritual than the other, in my, in my view. It was, it was that they, some had a connection with him, some didn't. And it's the same was true with Baba. There were people that went into Baba's, you know, and saw Baba physically and had no connection with him whatsoever, and Baba said so. So these are very particular things, and the nature of the connection varies. So my connection with Dean Karoli Baba was like, um, it was a very significant connection in my life. And it, he was not ultimately to be my master, but he was playing a very significant role for me. And I think uh, uh, the woman in um, Myrtle Beach, who was a follower of Anaya Khan, saw some, Laura, Delevingne. Laura Delevingne, another example, she's a follower of Anaya Khan. And then he passed her on to Baba. And so these, that, these relationships really do vary. Um, but it, it's, but sometimes people will say, well, I didn't feel anything about this particular person. They must not be, you know, advanced or something like that. And my reaction is, it, it, if they're advanced and they did and you had no connection with them, you wouldn't think that they were advanced. That's sort of, you know, or you, you may well not, maybe you would, but you may well not, they may well veil you from that experience of them. And that, I think that's a really important thing to, you know, I've been very important for me to understand uh, in my life. And, uh, and the last thing I'd say about it, just to say, uh, I think each one of us has an experience of coming to Baba that's very unique. And it's very unique to us. And it's, it's you know, I've known people that heard Baba's name and they became Baba lovers. Or, you know, I've known people that have gone through, inc you know, incredible, you know, turmoil and then became Baba lovers. Or people that, you know, whatever it is, it's how Baba brought us to them. Or people that were children of Baba lovers who then had to go through their own kind of rejection and then reincorporation of Baba into their lives. And all of that's, it's all very unique. And Baba, and to me, it's much more indicative of Baba's love for us that he creates these circumstances that allow us to come to him and, and surrender to him. And, and, and to make it so that the point that we surrender, there's not wobbling. Of, you know, there's not an ultimate, there may be wobbling like this, but it's not a wobbling, it's not, a, it doesn't take us away from him. And I, to me, that's Baba's, that's Baba who creates those circumstances that, that make that possible. So those are some of my reflections about that experience that I had. Now, I was also asked, I've got a few minutes left. About 10, minutes. 10 minutes, good. Uh, I was also asked to say a little bit about the um, establishment of the Mayor Baba Group in Washington, D.C. Um, so after I returned from India that trip, I settled in North Carolina um, and lived there for a year and a half. Um, and then 
decided to go back to school and, and get my uh, degrees in counseling psychology. And so I left there, I moved back to the Washington DC area and lived there and that was 1974. Now I was very, I remained very close with Kitty and Kitty by the way when I related the story to her about telling me to go to Rishikesh, she has absolutely no memory of that. <laughs> and, and that was Kitty. Kitty was just a conduit for Baba. And you know, you know, it was like Baba would take Kitty and you know, move her aside and talk and then bring Kitty back. That was, that was how Kitty was for so many people. I'm not, I'm not unique in that regard. But I, I was very close with Kitty. And, um, and so when I moved to Washington, Kitty uh, said to me, you should start a Baba group there. There's no Baba group. And I found there, there actually was a Baba group. It was a group run by two people who were preceptors within Sufism Reoriented, Andy and Peggy Muir, some of you may know them. And they were, uh, they, Sufism Reoriented had two basic centers, one in California, one in Washington, D.C. And so Andy and Peggy had a group of Sufis, but every Friday night they would have a meeting that was open to non-Sufis, though it was very, I think, very Sufi-like and run on Sufi conditions. Um, and uh, and Kitty, Kitty, I knew this, Kitty talked talk about it, and she felt there should be a group, those conditions were, I, Kitty wanted there to be a group there that was not, uh, there was a more open group, that it was a more, <coughs> there, was, there was more openness to people, that rather than having to you know, come in through this kind of corridor, it was open like that. I don't know how to describe it more than that. But, uh, so Kitty said, how about starting a group? And I was 23 years old or 24 at the time, 20, 23. And I was very nervous. Like, there are these two very well-established people. They're running a Baba group there who are very strong authorities with Baba. And I'm a 23-year-old guy who doesn't, who's, you know, really new to Baba. Who am I to start a group? And so I begged off. And uh, when I moved to Washington, I went to the, the um, Andy and Peggy Muir's group. And it didn't, it didn't fit for me. I did it for a year, and it just didn't take root. There, it wasn't my way. It didn't, you know, just wasn't my thing. So after a year, I dropped out of the group. Meanwhile, every time I go to the center, which was very often, Kitty would say, why don't you start a group? And I kept sort of, you know, evading her. So I, I dropped out of the group for a year. And then after a year, I was in Kitty's office one day. And once again, Kitty said to me, how about starting that group in Washington? And she must have gotten me at a weak moment because I said yes. <laughs> and, and so we, 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 we just sat together and we mapped it out. We mapped out you know, how often it would meet and she gave me names of people to contact and you know, what should we do in the group and things like that. And so I went back to Washington and I called up a bunch of people. At the time I was living in, an, in a converted barn on a 50 acre farm that I rented. And so I invited them over there and the first thing, one of the first things we did in the group was we drafted a letter to Peggy and Andy Muir to, informing them you know, to try to be respectful. We, we've just started a group, you know, we just want you to know that so you don't think we're doing anything behind your back or anything. And we sent it. So um, the group uh, met and um, it turned out that um, uh, Peggy and Andy, uh, I guess Andy, I don't know so much about Peggy, um, he believed that we'd been meeting for years behind his, their back. And he was very unhappy with it this group, very angry that it was going on. And we, you know, we tried to get the message to him, that's not true, you know, the first thing, first order of business was to let you know, but nevertheless, he was, he was holding on down. And, and so relations between the two groups was actually very diff difficult. And, um, and, and there was really no contact. I remember once Ivy Deuce came to Washington and we went to see her and we were barred entry because of the feeling about that. So it, it was not pleasant just to say the least. Our, you know, we had friends who were Sufis and were perfectly pleasant there, but with the leadership level, it was not going well. So um, meanwhile, Kitty, Kitty was, you know, always um, supportive. She was, she was advising me, and then later, those of us that were providing leadership there, um, and Elizabeth as well, uh, very strongly supportive. She came up 
for um, when I got married to my first wife, she came up for a wedding and like that. But um, but the relationship was tense there. And then in 1978, Adi K. Ronnie came to Washington, and he was we sponsored his trip, and he was, he stayed at the home of a man named Ned Foot, who was a uh, a very early Sufi under Sufism reoriented, very very interesting man. I could probably spend half an hour talking about Ned, but um, but anyway, not, Adi was very close with him, and, and, he, and Adi stayed at his house or his apartment, and they called for a meeting of the two groups together, and so with you know Peggy Nandy and our group and a lot of people were there, and it all blew up. You know, and you know all of the feeling and anger, and so on. And meanwhile, Adi's sitting over there in a corner. Not, you know, I'm a mediator and facilitator by background and training and practice. Uh, Adi was not a facilitator, <laughs> and he wasn't mediating. He wasn't doing anything. He was just sitting there. But somehow, all I can say is, at, it, 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 there was it was very explosive, and all of these accusations and counter accusations were coming out. But you know, when it was over, it was all over. And somehow it dissipated all of the bad feeling in the group, and it had nothing to do with the manifest content of anything that had been said. It just happened, and I, I don't know how Baba did it. Whether it was Adi being there, whatever it was, but somehow Baba just dissipated it. And from that point on, we were friendly in the two groups. And then, just as a postscript to that, um, a few years later, Peggy and Andy left Sufism Reoriented. Um, it, many of you probably know the history of some of that kind of stuff when the changes happened with the succession of the Murshida and so on. And they left the group and they became part of our group. So it was, it was interesting. And our group really you know, lived, has li lived on for many years. And I provided leadership along with a number of other people, Buzz and Wendy, my wife, ex-wife Pamela, um, really were the main ones for 20-some 20, 20 years um, until all of us left Washington. Like that. So that's the story of it. And again, I just want to say two or three reflections on that, and then I'll give up the floor here. Because I think uh, there are three things that I would say that, as I ref about that. Number one was one of the things that Kitty said to me from the very beginning, one of the first things she said to me when, when I agreed to run the group, she said, never pay attention to numbers. She said, numbers don't matter at all. And it's some of the wisest advice I've ever been given. Because I did find that you know, we'd have meetings of three people that were fantastic. And we'd have meetings of 20 people that were eh, like that. It was always the quality of Baba and Baba's presence, Baba's love, it had nothing to do. And it's so, the mind, at least my mind, so easy to look at numbers and correlate that with significance or with importance. It has In Baba's world, has nothing to do with it. The second thing is just at a very personal level, um, when Kitty asked me to do this, my first reaction was, who am I to do this? Like, what, 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 what right or what legitimacy do I have to start a Baba group? That was my reaction. And yet, I had to switch from why me to why not me. You know, and um, i just share one little anecdote because I think it's such a wonderful anecdote. I know Rick Chapman was supposed to be this featured guest here and couldn't come, so I'll tell a Rick Chapman story. Um, I was in India once in Mondali Hall when Rick Chapman was there. He used to go every year and for several months to be with Erich and help Erich. And there were a number of us in, the, in Mondali Hall that day, and somebody said, um, asked if they could sing a song. And Erich says, yeah, sure. And so he said, well, I need a guitar. And so somebody went into one of the pilgrim resting rooms and got one of these guitars there. And it was nowhere like the guitar I played here. It was, you know, probably a warped fretboard. It was old strings, you know. And so the guy gets the guitar, uh, and some and somebody looks at the guitar and say, "It's not much of a guitar," you know. And somebody else says, "Yeah, but it's here." And Rick says, "Well, isn't that kind of like all of us here in this room? We may we may not be the best, to, you know." quality disciples in the world that, that a master could have, but hey, we're here. <laughs> so let me just close with that, if I could. Jay Bob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.